you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Bye, folks. This is Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Be sure to see the video version of this. Go to youtube.com for just Chris Voss at the bell notification button over there. Also, go see us on goodreads.com for just Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there as well. Go over to all our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram. All over the place. There's a million different places you can go to get access to the Chris Voss Show and the groups and everything that we're talking about as well. Today, we have an amazing author on the show, David R. Stokes. He's the author of the newest book to come out, June 1st, 2021, John F. Kennedy's, or I'll just say it as it's titled, JFK's Ghost, Kennedy, Sorensen, and the Making of Profiles in Courage. This should be a pretty interesting book. And this episode is brought to you by a sponsor, ifi-audio.com and their micro IDSD signature. It's a top of the range desktop transportable DAC and headphone app that will supercharge your headphones. It has two brown burr DAC chips in it and will decode high-res audio and MQA files. We're using it in the studio right now. I've loved my experience with it so far. It just makes everything sound so much more richer and better and takes things to the next level. IFI Audio is an award-winning audio tech company with one aim in mind, to improve your music enjoyment of quality sound, eradicate noise, distortion, and hiss from your listening experience. Check out their new incredible lineup of DACs and audio enhancement devices at ifi-audio.com. He is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author. His book, The Shooting Salvationists, appeared twice on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list in 2011. The story has been republished entitled Apparent Anger, and he's also done screenplays based on two of his novels, Camelot's Cousins, and or cousin, I should say, and Jack and Dick, and they're currently being represented for production in Hollywood. David, welcome to the show. It's a wonderful to have you on. I've been looking forward to it, Chris. Thanks. Thank you. And so are we. Let's talk about your great new book that's out. Congratulations for getting it out. Uh, give us your plugs so that people can find you on the interwebs. Okay, so my website's davidrstokes.com. That's my handle at Twitter, David R. Stokes. Got to use that middle initial R, David R. Stokes. And a Facebook author, the same. And uh, you mentioned Goodreads earlier. Right now, they're doing a giveaway uh, for oh. the book so they can enter this thing. It's, I don't know how much time is left on it, but uh, it's a good week, uh, Goodreads uh, giveaway. But uh, davidrstokes.com is the main place to go. There you go, guys. Go check them out. Order the book up where fine books are sold. Right. And David, tell us what motivates you to write this book. Well, I I retired from the ministry. I was a pastor for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, I didn't want to just sit around. So I've been a writer for a number of years, published a number of books while I was a pastor. And so I I fell into some ghostwriting jobs. People asked me to help them write books. And it made me really interested in ghostwriting. And so I began to research ghostwriting as I was doing it and came up with the idea to write up. It's like the old Seinfeld bit with Kramer writing a coffee table book about coffee tables. (laughs) I decided to write a, a ghost, a book about a ghostwriter. One of the most famous ghostwriting stories, certainly in the modern era, is uh, the story of Profiles and Courage, John F. Kennedy's Pulitzer Prize winning book that it's been rumored for years that he really didn't write the book himself. Mm-hmm. So I thought I would uh, delve into that. I dove deep and uh, got about 600 and some footnotes, endnotes in this book to document everything. And I think I've written, hopefully, the definitive account of this entire story. Wow, this is really interesting. It says here on Amazon, I'd rather win a Pulitzer Prize than be president of the United States, quoted by John F. Kennedy, which I think is some of your uh, writing about. That's interesting. So give us an overarching uh, view of the book. And A lot of people don't know that, that John F. Kennedy wasn't really set up for politics when he was growing up. He was pretty sickly. 
He was a voracious reader, and uh, by all accounts, he wanted to become a writer. He wrote it. In fact, his senior thesis at Harvard, he turned it into a best-selling book called While English, uh, While England Slept, with the help from a few friends. In fact, that story is a window into his later book, Profiles and Courage. He was a journalist at, at the after the war. He covered the United Nations uh, founding for the Hearst Syndicate, and he traveled wide and, and far and wide as a newspaper man. But of course, it was the death of his older brother, who was really the heir apparent. He was the one who was going to to follow in the father's footsteps, Joseph Kennedy's footsteps, and become the politician. He was the natural. John F. Kennedy wasn't a natural. He had personal charm, could light up any room, but not on the public stage. But he morphed into this. And in 1953, after he'd been elected to the Senate, one of his first hires in as a senator was to hire a, a staffer, a young aide by the name of Theodore Sorensen, Ted Sorensen. And they became pretty close, alter egos in a sense. And, and when you think of John F. Kennedy now and looking back, many opinions about him, but we think of his eloquence and his capacity to inspire some of his great speeches. That was Ted Sorensen, Theodore Sorensen, his speechwriter, who gave him his, his political voice and really matured him in that way. So wow. I deal with that. And then, of course, they decided to, uh, a book about courage came out. It was, it was, I think, a part of a marketing strategy to, to paint Kennedy, who was a very young aspirant for the White House. Remember, he'd be following the oldest man at that time ever to serve as president. So he had to do some things to, to give him some gravitas and some credibility and, and becoming a, a published author and getting that Pulitzer Prize. Boy, that was really important part of the puzzle. And so he did that, and the rest, as they say, is history. Wow. So do you, in your studies and research, do you think he would have become president without the, the leaping board of this book? It's interesting. That was one piece of the puzzle, and I think it's been underrated as a piece of the puzzle. And he, winning the Pulitzer was extremely important. It, it gave him, it put him, it made him a national figure mm-hmm. more than anything else at the time in 1956 and 1957, 58 in the buildup to the 1960 campaign. I think he probably would have captured the nomination. I remember it was a razor thin victory over Nixon in 1960, 100,000 votes, popular votes. And so it's, it's an open question as to whether he would. But I will tell you one of the things I deal with in the book is that if it ever came out or was proven that he didn't really write the book, but yet got, took the Pulitzer Prize, in other words, as his own work, that scandal might have submarined everything more than any other scandal. That and he had health issues, and he had personal, you know, issues of philandering and so forth. That's pretty well documented. And but the real, the, the third, the third leg on that stool is this Pulitzer Prize. And if, if that would have been proven that he didn't really write the book, then that would have submarined him. I think. Yeah, that would have made all the difference in the world. Do you think with your writing, are people going to come away with the total proof that he didn't write the book or was ghostwritten, or is there still ambiguity? I don't know that there's really any ambiguity. And I think that the issue had been pretty much resolved even before I picked up my pen to to write this. But what I do is I really dwell, uh, drill deep uh, in the oral histories. I used a lot of the stuff at the Kennedy Library itself, the correspondence files, going back with correspondence between Sorensen and Kennedy, and other people, the editor of the book at the time. Uh, yeah, I think it's the definitive account. This is a story that's been in various, Chris Wallace, for instance, in, in one of his uh, books about Kennedy, pretty much says that John F. Kennedy didn't really write Profiles and Courage. <laughs> but they say that, and, and then they move on. Yeah. It's, it's never been treated in, as a one-book kind of treatment where you fill in all the blanks, and that's what I've mm-hmm. tried to do. I, unless a person is really just a person who is in complete denial reading my book or a propagandist that's reading my book. I think they come away with a pretty clear picture of it. John F. Kennedy, for all of his gifts and abilities, wasn't the person who actually wrote the entire book. He was more of a line editor for the book. Wow. Editor in chief. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Chief. The, this is really interesting. This is amazing. Mm-hmm. It just basically was written by the, by Ted Sorensen then. Yeah. It's documented in the book that he wrote the entire first draft of the book. Wow. And uh, most of the second draft. And then Kennedy got involved at various times. And the same thing was true with Kennedy's thesis that became a book in 1940, in 1940s at the outbreak of World War II that became While England Slept, that Kennedy was never unwilling to take help from people. This is a man who grew up having people do things for him. Now think mm-hmm. about that. Obviously, he, he was privileged. He, he never knew 
the Kennedys, the kids never knew what the Great Depression was. They never experienced it because they were insulated from that uh, while the rest of the world was suffering. And this is not a criticism. This is a statement of fact. Mm -hmm. And so he grew up privileged and always had an entourage of people doing things for him. So he could delegate and be pretty hands off. And yet things would then he'd take the credit uh, later on for it. Yeah, this that's a given. So what are the sort of surprises or different standout things that you think uh, readers are going to be find in the book that they're going to be like, oh, my gosh. One of the surprising things to me in research, and, and, and it's a subtext uh, of the book, is dealing with Kennedy's health, particularly as a young man. I really go into that because that was part of his what made him such a reader and a person who is much more involved with with intellectual ideas than maybe his brothers were. And he spent a lot of time in bed. He almost died several times, even when he was a senator and some surgeries during the actual writing or the creation of Profiles and Courage. So I think I learned a lot more about his health. I learned a lot more about the family dynamics and some of the ways that uh, he tried to separate himself from his very driven father, the rivalry between his, his brother, but also that whole capacity to have other people step up and do things for him that I think he, he just saw as the normal way to live. Mm -hmm. and, and that was uh, somewhat uh, surprising. Now, when you talk about the rivalry between his brother, was that uh, Bobby? No, that was his or, older brother, Joe Kennedy Jr., Joe, who was yeah. the darling. When you study the dynamics of the Kennedy family, the oldest brother was Joe Kennedy Jr., mm. who was uh, killed on a, on, a, on a mission during the Second World War, and not long after John F. Kennedy had survived the PT-109 incident, which I tell the story of that in the book, of course, which has been recounted various times. But it all plays into the concept of courage that was a fascination of Kennedy's. So when his brother died, the brother was always going to be the guy. The dad wanted to be president. He, he, he had plans in the 30s to, to run in 1940, assuming that Roosevelt wasn't going to run for president himself. But, but he shot himself in the foot in a number of ways I deal with in the book. So the oldest son, he was going to be the guy. And he was an outgoing, charismatic, dynamic, natural politician. John F. Kennedy, or Jack as he was known to his friends, was not. But when the brother died, it was almost like, okay, now you're it. He became the heir apparent, and, and the father was a very driven man and in a lot of ways wanted to fulfill his own ambitions through his sons. Yeah. It's an interesting uh, just whole dynamic that they had as a family and how they built everything. And so should the uh, – can you retract a Pulitzer Prize? Uh, oh, yeah, I, I don't think they can, and I certainly, <laughs> I certainly would not. I certainly would not. I would be somewhat horrified if part and parcel of my book was that that was taken away. I think that's water under the bridge. It's a done deal. Maybe the rules were a bit different in the 1950s than they are now in the day and age of – that we have now, th people, how do I say it? They got away with a lot more back then. The fix was in. And I don't, it was, it was a manipulative process. And the Kennedy entourage was pretty good at that. I, that may sound like a catty thing to say, but it was politics as usual pretty much back then. They just played the game by the rules they knew. At the same time, that wouldn't, it wouldn't fly today. I, it would probably be if he were to get the Pulitzer Prize today and it would come out six months later, but he hadn't written the book, they'd retract it. But I doubt 65 years, it was 65 years ago the book came out, 64 years ago he got the Pulitzer. I doubt that's going to be counted. And as I said, I'd be somewhat horrified and I'd want to apologize to the family. Didn't mean for that to happen. I wouldn't mind if I won the Pulitzer Prize, but I don't want the one taken away. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there, you there you go. So what do you hope readers going to come away with, with the conclusions or, or one conclusion or conclusions? Or, or is it just really a good a good data point or experience or information to go, hey, here's you know kind of how this happened? Here's my agenda. I wanted to tell the story. Mm -hmm. I like stories. I think that's basically what history is. Barbara Tuckman, the, the great uh, late historian who wrote The Guns of August, number, March of Folly, other books, they asked her one time how to write history, and she said, write stories. And so I've written a story. It's a narrative nonfiction. It's short chapters. They're not long chapters, 1,200, 1,500 words each. It's a page turner. That's what people have told me. And I tell the story of this from the very beginning when he was accused of not writing the book on national television, on Mike Wallace's uh, television show on a Saturday night in December of 1957. And I hope the telling of the story is what grabs people. And then let, and I lay the facts out. I research it. I, everything 
that needs to be documented is documented. They can check it out. And I think you come away with the conclusion that, hey, it looks like Ted Sorensen really wrote this book and he took all the credit. It'd be the kind of book today where someone would say, John F. Kennedy with Ted Sorensen on the cover. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it wasn't that way. And I'm, I've done some ghostwriting and I've signed NDAs. So there are books that, that are out there that, that my fingerprints are all over, but I can't really tell people that I was involved. <laughs> but that was the understanding I went into and then I was comp compensated for it. And yeah. by the way, so was Ted Sorensen. Well, he better have been, darn it. Yeah, so that... liberally and generously compensated. <laughs> did Ted Sorensen, uh, uh, forgive me for a uh, okay. misplacement of history, did he end up in the John F. Kennedy administration? Oh, I imagine yeah, he, he sure did. He was, in fact, he was the person who wrote, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do uh, for your country. He was he was his primary speechwriter, but he was even larger than a speechwriter. All, all presidents have had them. He became an aide in many ways, a confidant of President Kennedy, part of that inner circle of the White House administration at the time. Yes. And he wrote a massive biography of Kennedy after John F. Kennedy died. It was simply called Kennedy. And it was an award-winning book, but he was, he was with Kennedy until the end and survived. He actually helped Lyndon Johnson write his first speech when he had to speak before a joint session of Congress just days after uh, Kennedy was killed. So, mm -hmm. yeah, he was in the White House. Ask her or not what you can do for your country. Yeah, and right, exactly. <laughs> can you imagine anybody getting elected anything with that kind of ethic? Hey, don't ask what your country can do for you, but what you're going to do. You could be elected dog catcher in Des Moines, Iowa, with that kind of approach. It definitely was a different time in America. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Oh, man. Now, you talk about in the book how he was hypersensitive about rumors and casting down on his authorship of a Jack Kennedy was, or John F. Kennedy was. What was your, what was the take on that? Yeah, he, obviously it was, he had for so long said that he wrote the book and dug his heels in and doubled down and everybody around him had verified that. Even Sorensen himself, he actually signed a, a legal affidavit to the effect, which when you look in hindsight was certainly perjury. So he was sensitive about it to the extent that uh, a lot of people that, that will defend it and say he was seen writing on yellow legal pads, you know, he had back surgery, he was writing upside down, and people witnessed him do that. They don't realize that a lot of that was just staged. It was designed. And so there are enough papers at the Kennedy Library written in his hand, different fragments of this story that makes it look like he did. But anybody who really drills deep, and there have been many researchers that I'm indebted to who have done that spade work long before I came along, that uh, just it doesn't pass the smell test. Note to self, if you ever hire a ghostwriter, make sure you go back and rewrite the script on a yellow page. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, there's a great story, and I deal with the story in the book. There's a great story in 1961, just before Kennedy was inaugurated. He's on his little plane called the Caroline. This is before he had Air Force One. And uh, there's a, a famous journal journalist who is there on the plane with him. Kennedy had a close relationship. And Kennedy took a, a yellow piece of paper a pad out, and he already had his inaugural speech, the Ask Not But Your oh. Country, in front of typewritten, all done. This is just a day, couple of days before the inauguration. And he starts actually recreating it in his own hand. Mm -hmm. And he makes the statement to uh, somebody that copies of FDR's first inaugural in his own hand went for $100,000. <laughs> and tucked it into a drawer. And uh, so, yeah, that, the, the, there was some stagecraft there. and well, Money-making stagecraft. Yeah, and I don't know that he was in it for the money. I don't think he needed uh, the money. Yeah, he didn't need but the he money was making the point, uh, yeah. and he showed this to a journalist, and a journalist was con this journalist was convinced that, that he was seeing the original draft of the – in fact, that draft is still at the Kennedy Library today. Oh, wow. Uh, and yet it was created, it was it was a handwritten copy of something he'd already had typewritten. So what does the Kennedy family or the Kennedy Library think about this book? Did, have they... I don't know, and I haven't had, I did a lot of research mm -hmm. there, and I'm indebted to them because there are tremendous files that are open to the public there. Even in the time of COVID, once it shut down, I was still able to, to get some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I deal with, a, in the back, there are numerous oral histories that were made to possible by the Kennedy Library. And, of course, correspondence files, Sorensen's files, Kennedy's files, his father's files, other authors, other historians, and so forth. So it's all there. It's all hiding in plain sight. But I think out of, some people may think, what's the point? Here it is all these years after the guy died, let him rest in peace. And I think that that's fine. But from the historical standpoint, it is important not just to bury 
things and cover things up. And I don't, I'm an admirer of John. When I was a kid, he was my hero. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I probably agree with a lot of his politics back then, wish some people would do the same things right now. But at the same time, you got to take this where, wherever it goes. There were, he deceived the people about a number of things. All politicians do. Yeah. He deceived them about his health, for instance, to dying mm-hmm. that he had Addison disease when he did till his, to his dying day. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he pulled a fast one on the people and he got away with it. There, there is nothing but punitive that needs to happen, except people need to realize that he was a man with a capacity to expire. And he did. We went to the moon because he had that vision. Yeah. But he was also a flawed man and not to put him on a pedestal, you know, that way. And I think that's true. It's important to understand how these, how men like these are made or created yeah. or right. with the cumulative effort of different people like uh, Ted Sorensen or, mm-hmm. and others are vaulted to these positions of power and understanding them and what they're about and how they got there. And like you say, the whole history. And I think we'll be writing books about JFK until the end of time. Well, fascinating, uh, <laughs> fascinating man. And it was a brief, a brief period of time, but a lot of it was spun. The whole Camelot thing didn't even come along until a, about a, two weeks after he died. And it was contrived by Jackie Kennedy and Theodore White. And she really wanted that to be how her husband was remembered. Oh, know? wow. He loved the Broadway play. They used to listen to the record of the soundtrack of it, let it never be forgot that once there was a spot that for one brief and shining moment was known as Camelot. And Ted uh, Theodore White, who had written The Making of the President in 1960, he filed uh, for Life magazine and told that story and the, the legend was born. Wow. And now it's synonymous with Kennedy's administration. Yeah, it's amazing, man. It's amazing yeah. how yeah. how our how our history is manipulated and yeah. how things are done. And this is early PR, really marketing. Yeah, oh, they, they were experts in it, and people are still today experts in it. You don't get anywhere in in public life without a measure of it. You've got to admire that capacity. And they played the game by the by the rules. They just played it better than most. Is that uh, is that shot of you said Mike Wallace uh, calling John out on on. Mm-hmm. On the thing is that online? Is that on YouTube? I, I give the transcript in the book. It, mm-hmm. I, there, it it is on Mike Wallace's show. Actually, the guy that did it was a, a, probably one of the most famous journalists of the day, long forgotten. Now his name was Drew Pearson, mm. and and Drew Pearson was an, was a guest on that show. And this is in 1957, December of 57. Listen to this. This is after Eisenhower had a couple of heart attacks and a stroke, and so they were talking about the president's health and. It, And you'd think what I'm about to tell you would be the thing that would be remembered from that show. Drew Pearson said that he predicted within one year, this is 57, Eisenhower was going to resign and Richard Nixon would become the president of the United States because he was the VP. You'd think that would be the Twitter, the tweeted moment, right? Mm -hmm. Right? But then they went on to talk about 1960 and they began to talk about, you know, how Nixon was the front runner for the Republic. This senator from Massachusetts was already the front runner for the Democrats. And Drew Pearson, at that point on national television, said that he's had a great PR buildup, and I'm paraphrasing now. He's the only guy I know uh, who's gotten a Pulitzer Prize for a book that was ghostwritten for him. And Mike Wallace was taken back, said, you know this for sure? He says, I sure do. And, and by all accounts, Kennedy and his wife Jackie were watching. That was Saturday night, 10 o'clock show. We're watching. Mm-hmm. And by Monday morning, it was like circle of the wagons. You talk about a, a crisis and they got their, their defense machine into full defensive mode. Yeah. So that's I deal crazy. with that in the book. I don't want to give it all away, but that's how the book starts. Ah, so. Some more teasers. Any other teasers you want to tease out before we go? No, I think that you pretty much covered it. I just think it's a fascinating story. And the concept of courage, first of all, and historians will bear this out. Even though Kennedy wrote about political courage, he wrote it right after he had failed to take a stand against Senator Joseph McCarthy. Mm -hmm. And he's the only Democrat that didn't go on the record voting uh, for the censure of McCarthy in the Senate. And so he writes this book about courage to establish himself as a man of courage. You're hard pressed to find anything in the political career of John F. Kennedy, even as president, where he exhibited the kind of courage he writes about with the people and profiles and courage, which is designed. These are men who did what they thought was the right thing, even though it was politically unpopular with their own party. That was the thesis of the book. Mm -hmm. And he may not have had a political courage, but he had physical courage. He survived sickness and illness and surgeries. This was a tough guy. And Mm -hmm. then if you know the whole account of PT 109, when he basically 
He literally dragged a man to shore for a couple of miles who couldn't swim by putting a rope around him and using his teeth to, to swim him to shore. This yeah. is a man of tremendous courage. And so I, I think, I don't want people to think that I'm bashing the guy. Mm. I pretty much prove he took a Pulitzer Prize he shouldn't have taken. Mm. You know, he'll have to live with that. We'll have to live with that. We're, Bill Clinton said this about Nixon when Nixon died. He spoke at Nixon's funeral. He says, let the time for judging Nixon on anything other than his full life uh, be behind us. And mm -hmm. I think with Kennedy, you have to take the flaws, but you take the good with the bad. And I think he did have the capacity to inspire us. And we can't help but see his life looking back through the prism of his assassination and because of the violence of that moment, it, your heart, it, you have, it tempers everything. Yeah, but look at how he died and look yeah. at the sacrifice he made. But I hope I've told the story in a compelling way that page after page turns, people will find this book to be interesting. It really would have, the thing I always thought about, even being as a kid, we talked in the green room about how one of the first books I read was 1,000 Days. Right. My mom had it. And I think I still have it saved somewhere. It's like an original copy and or printing or whatever. But it was really an interesting book to read. And I always wondered, what would it have been like if he hadn't been assassinated or right. survived the assassination attempt? Right. Uh, if that was possible. But what would the rest of the next years of his administration been like well, you know, if he won again? So those are the what ifs. Uh, he was in somewhat political trouble in the fall of 1963. Part of his reason to go to Texas was to mend fences out there in, with the Texas party that was falling apart. But there were some potential scandals that were ready to, to, to confront him. It's, no, it's not at all a foregone conclusion that he would have been able to win re-election in 1964. And, and the other question that, that overshadows it all is, would we have gotten into Vietnam as deep? Would, mm -hmm. Johnson kept taking us deeper and deeper. Kitty, Kennedy, Eisenhower started it, but Kennedy had us there, and Johnson then doubled down and doubled down again and exponentially there. So those are the questions that we'll never know. I think they're fascinating what ifs, but he, Ted Kennedy, when Robert Kennedy died, I don't know if you remember the speech that he gave at the St. Patrick's Cathedral, the eulogy, and he talked about let us not make him larger in death than he was in life. But it's impossible to do that when someone's martyred. Yeah. And they did that with Bobby Kennedy and to a certain extent, Jack Kennedy. But uh, I hope people enjoy the book. I hope I've told the story in a compelling way. I think you'll come away, I think, convinced whether you want to be or not. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It's been wonderful to have you on, David. Give us your plug so that people can find you on the internet. Okay. Uh, my website's davidrstokes.com. On Twitter, I'm at David R. Stokes on Facebook. Of course, the book, JFK's Ghost, Kennedy Sorensen and the Making of Profiles and Courage is available wherever books are sold, wherever you order books. And, and if you buy it and read it, give me a review wherever you buy it. Appreciate that very much. And Chris, thanks so much for having me on. And thank you for uh, coming on, David. We certainly are honored. Appreciate it. No, great. Thank you. There you go. All right. To my audience, uh, take and check out the book, JFK's Ghost. Kennedy Sorensen and the Making of Profiles in Courage just barely came off the book of the uh, printing press there. June 1st, 2021. You can order up, be the first one on your block to say you read it or your book club. Go to youtube.com for just Chris Voss. See all the wonderful videos we have on there. Go to goodreads.com for just Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing. You can go to all the groups we have on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. There's just everything, Instagram, all that good stuff. And uh, check us out. Thanks to everyone for being here. Stay safe and we'll see you guys 